Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Steve Donovan, and I have the privilege of serving as the Director of Alumni Relations at Trinity College. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you all continue to be safe and well. We also wish we could be welcoming you all back to our beautiful campus this weekend for a more traditional homecoming, but these times are hardly traditional. We've built an exciting array of virtual events this weekend and hope you'll join us for some of them. You'll find the full schedule on the front page of the college's website at trincall.edu. We'll particularly miss not being able to celebrate our rich athletic traditions and impressive student athletes and coaches with competitions over the weekend. But we're happy to bring some of that to you with today's panel of coaches moderated by Trinity's talented athletic director, Drew Galbraith. Drew joined Trinity in October of 2017 as the Director of Athletics and the Chair of Physical Education, and he's made a significant impact on Bantam Athletics in very short order. His experience spans 30 years of NCAA Division I, II, and III Collegiate Athletics Administration at Trinity. At Trinity, I should say, Drew is responsible for um, Trinity's 30 varsity teams, over 700 varsity student athletes, as well as 70 coaches and staff. In addition, he oversees all club and intramural activities and chairs the college's physical education department, which offers dozens of classes each semester. Drew came to Trinity after 14 years at Dartmouth College, where we were colleagues, he was a Senior Associate Director of Athletics and Executive Director of Dartmouth Peak Performance, a program that integrates services and resources to help student athletes achieve excellence. Drew is active in NCAA committee service, having served previously on the NCAA Academics, Eligibility and Compliance Cabinet, the Division I Administration Cabinet, the NCAA Division I Men's Soccer Committee, and the NCAA Men's and Women's Skiing Committee. He chaired the soccer committee for two years and the skiing committee for four years. Drew earned both a bachelor's degree and a law degree from the College of William and Mary. He began his career in media relations and broadcasting at Virginia Commonwealth University. He joined Dartmouth in 2004 after serving in compliance roles in the athletics departments at William and Mary and the University of Nebraska Omaha. It's my pleasure, Drew, to turn the stage over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Steve, and thank you all for joining us on a, on a Friday afternoon. Pleasure to be joined today by three of our very talented head coaches. Uh, I have Emily Garner, who is in her fifth year as our women's basketball coach. Uh, Kevin McDermott, uh, in his 15th year at Trinity, 11th as the head coach of our men's rowing program. And Matt Greeson, Trinity class of 2003, uh, in his ninth year as the head coach of men's hockey, and he is also the head uh, coach of men's golf. And our our conversation today is really going to focus around uh, recruiting, um, how we generate uh, classes of talented young men and young women uh, to come to Trinity and participate in uh, varsity athletics here, and how, how we, we try to help shape some of our campus culture through that, that process. Um, but just to give you a little sense of, of where we are, because in the same way that we're doing virtual homecoming activities this weekend, uh, really all of our lives in athletics and around the college have changed dramatically in the past uh, six and a half months. So as uh, we had so many uh, students return to campus this fall, including a lot of first years, uh, that's very exciting for us. And so uh, one of our roles within athletics is to make sure that we're still providing a, a robust experience for, uh, you know, for all of our students and, and specifically our varsity student athletes. Uh, just last Friday, we began practice in all of our fall and spring sports. And so while those practices look a little bit different than they might have in the past, uh, our students are all wearing masks right now. Um, we're observing six feet of distance uh, in our activities right now. As we continue to do a great job in managing the virus on campus, we can slowly relax those restrictions for our student athletes. On October 15th, we'll begin uh, practices for all of our winter sports. And so on that day, uh, for the first time in Trinity's history, we'll have every single, um, every single uh, student athlete practicing as of October 15th, which will be exciting. It's, it's a stress on our staff and our coaches, but it, it'll be very exciting for uh, all of us who support those activities. Um, as we go through this afternoon's program, I just mentioned uh, the best place to get questions in is in the Q&A function, um, either on the top or the bottom of your screen. And then we'll get those answers uh, out as many as, as we can. And if, if there are ones for the panel, then we'll make sure that we are uh, as, asking those of panelists. So a couple of quick words on, on what recruiting is. Uh, the coaches will 
uh, maybe smirk when they hear me say this. Uh, I say in our department a lot that recruiting has got to be like oxygen to a head coach of a college sport. It really is uh, the lifeblood of what we do because it's how we generate that next great class of students and, and fill our campus uh, with uh, amazing recruited student athletes. Uh, this year, 610 first years enrolled at, at Trinity uh, just a few weeks ago. 195 of them were recruited uh, varsity athletes. Uh, there were several more who were uh, talked to about walking on and trying out for teams when they came here. So uh, more than a third of the class is coming in, planning on participating in a varsity sport at Trinity. As Steve said, uh, we have over 700 students uh, who are participating in varsity sports at any given time. And so that's a really, really big part of our college uh, fabric are those varsity student athletes. Um, well, of course, the numbers are great. We also have to keep in mind, we're not just trying to fill a roster. We're also trying to help admissions meet a number of different needs uh, that they have, uh, whether those are diversity initiatives, those and diversity in lots of different ways. It's geographic diversity, socioeconomic diversity. So we, you know, we are as are any other NESCAC Ivy athletic department, really a wing of the admissions office, if you will, in that we're trying to help generate classes that really add to our campus community. So our coaches spend uh, so much time uh, not only evaluating prospects in person and, and uh, over video, but also communicating with those prospects uh, starting in their junior year and ultimately uh, hopefully matriculating students who want to be at Trinity, uh, see Trinity as a first choice institution and want to continue their academic and athletic careers here. So we'll, we'll talk about a number of different aspects of many questions were sent in and we'll work our way through this. Uh, so just one quick COVID note about recruiting. Uh, when we got to, uh, when uh, college sports shut down right around the same time as pro sports in early March, at that point, the NESCAC presidents uh, put a recruiting ban in place uh, that was very similar to the recruiting ban in place for all of NCAA Division I. So our coaches have not been able to have any sort of in-person contact uh, with prospective students either on or off campus at recruiting events since March. Uh, that recruiting ban has been extended multiple times. And so right now, all of Division I, uh, the NESCAC, and several of the UAA schools, uh, Case Western, Wash U, Emory, Johns Hopkins, are in one of these recruiting bans where uh, we're just we're allowed to do any sort of electronic communication, uh, but we cannot do anything in person on or off campus, which dramatically changes what our coaches would normally have done all spring and summer in getting ready to uh, hopefully matriculate freshmen for the fall of 2021. So with that, I'm going to ask each coach to reflect a little bit on this first question, which is, as we think about building championship driven teams here at Trinity, recruiting is obviously a, a plays a key role, not only in developing talent and finding talent, but also in helping find individuals who are going to build and sustain team culture. So what are some of the things that each of you look for, both tangibles, intangibles, as you're building that next great class of Bantams? Emily, I'll start with you. Absolutely, thanks Drew. I think talent is something obviously each one of us look for, but I think more than that, we look for um, chemistry and what's gonna be important in our team in terms of developing strengths on the court that allow us to be successful. Um, and I think with that, we obviously look for those who want to be a part um, of a place where you want to leave things better than you found it. I think we obviously look for uh, students who, who compete on a high level, but we also want to see how they respond and react in moments of adversity. So while we're evaluating some of their best games, we also want to evaluate some of their toughest moments. We want to see how they respond and react to their teammates and how they work to better those around them. Um, and I think what we're looking to create is, is an environment where they compete and they continue to um, up the level of play, but also add to our overall team culture and they work to create the most inclusive uh, and belonging environment that they can. Um, and that has, has helps contribute to overall success. Great. Kevin, you coach a sport that is uh, slightly different in that there are, there are people who are, I would say, relatively new to rowing, maybe in the last three or four years before you see them as recruits. So uh, same question to you. Yeah, um, I, I agree entirely with the talent evaluation. We certainly want to see success in on water performance and some of the objective measures that we use to evaluate oarsmen um, who are potential recruits in terms of their physiology and their um, athletic development overall. Um, on the intangible ones, I, I think we've had some really key um, moments over the last few years where 
in our recruiting class, we've talked about just their commitment to the team. And, and I think this reflects on what Coach Gardner just offered. Academics must come first. Um, that's what we preach. That's what we, we hope our kids really embody. But the team and their commitment to athletics and to the men's rowing team really has to come second. We want them to have other activities on campus. But if they have those three priorities in line, academics, at, then athletics, then other activities on campus, I think they can be a really important part of the team and building our culture um, because it's, it's really important to them and they really value their time and their investment with the squad. So we want to recruit people who understand that and are really able to buy in to that uh, formula. Great. And Coach Grecian, you've won a national championship, so obviously you understand how to, how to blend some of those tangibles and intangibles. Uh, same question to you. Yeah, I mean, you can't help but agree completely with what, what you've heard already. But I, we, we want people who, who just strive for excellence in every aspect of their life. Um, you go out, recruit, you try to find the best player, and then you come and vi have them visit campus. And then you really nail down a little bit to see how committed they are to every aspect of their life. Um, you know, I've never seen uh, somebody fail a test on a Friday afternoon and go out and have a great weekend of hockey. I've seen plenty of people go out there, ace a test on a Friday and go out and have the best weekend ever. If your life's in order um, and you demand excellence in everything you do from sleeping, eating, academics, athletics, those are the ones who are going to succeed and, and do it better than everybody else. And what we're after are people who want to do it better than anybody else in the country. Um, and if you're committed to your craft, committed to the weight room, committed to your academics, committed to ice hockey, more so than anybody else in the country at our level, then we're going we're gonna to do some great things. Um, you know, it's all well and good. I, I, I want to win Sky Championship. That's important. But my goal is to have uh, the most motivated student athletes you can find in all the land. Um, and then we're going to carry those traits that they learn, the traits that they cultivate here out into the real world. And that's what we're trying to build. And those are the ones we're trying to identify. Uh, well said. So as we as we think about what's taken place over the last six months, it has completely changed how all of us do recruiting. Um, no, no students coming through the hallways of Ferris Athletic Center or stopping by the boathouse to see, uh, you know, to see the garage with all the shells inside. Uh, Coach Garner didn't spend all of July uh, at, at camps and clinics and tournaments all around the country. Coach Greason not spending a whole lot of time in rinks this summer. So for all of you, and I'm going to start with Matt, how have you adapted your style uh, as we go through this year of COVID recruiting? And what are some creative things you've done um, when you've been trying to, to stay connected to students and programs and uh, coaches that you know who, fuel, who sent you recruits in, in such a, an odd time? It's, it's been a difficult practice for me. Um, I, uh, one of my flaws is I'm incredibly impatient and this is a process, especially this year where you have to be very patient. And so we've been uh, trying our best to evaluate um, players who we have in our, in the, in the stable from the previous year. But as Drew mentioned, uh, trying to cultivate the relationships with, or, or not cultivate, trying to harvest the relationships with those junior prep coaches who may have had, may have somebody for us and really trying to drill down on previous relationships, a little too much time watching video from last year, but at the same time, you, you are being productive, but it's gonna be a much more patient uh, process this year than most. I mean, I don't know when we'll fully be able to have people on campus, but the campus visit is the most integral part of the, of the recruiting process, getting to know those families. So I, I wish I had a real innovative catchphrase or something that I've done that's out of this world, but I think it's just gonna be a matter of trying to stay on top of relationships formed already, but at the same time, uh, trying to find some patience in this time where nobody wants to be patient. And Kevin, what about you? You know, the, not, not as many regattas early in the summer and probably uh, outside clubs are starting to resume activity. Where, how's it gone for you? Uh, I'm kind of the two different uh, approaches to answer that question. Yeah, no off-campus camps, regattas, championships, anything. So um, I echo what Coach Greason just offered. You're looking at past material, you know, and trying to cull through videotapes and references and all the evaluate, evaluative tools that you have, but they're from the junior year. I, I will say, like, for all of its kind of 
pitfalls and all of the challenges, the gripes that people have, Zoom has been, and other platforms, it's been really transformative in terms of connecting with recruits. Um, we found it to actually be a, I don't know, a kind of a, a real positive that you can connect with international kids much more easily. Kids in California, anywhere in the country, um, you can connect with their parents. You can have a Zoom chat, you know, multiple times over the, the summer with potential recruits. So I, I don't think that's suffered that much. I agree with Matt that in person, on campus, still super critical but the technology has really helped us connect with a lot of people. Um, I will also add that the assistant coach for the rowing program has given about 70 Zoom tours of our boathouse. So he'll connect with a recruit who sent in a recruiting questionnaire. Um, they set up a time, shows them the you know, fantastic facility that we have. So you know, you've tried to cultivate some normalcy um, with the technology, which um, I do think we've, we've done effectively. Well, and Coach Garner, I know, was at the forefront of uh, even recording some of those uh, FaceTime and Zoom tours. So, uh, Coach Garner, talk a little bit about in your sport and, and some of those strategies that you've uh, refined, say, over the last few months. Sure, absolutely. I think similar to what both Matt and Kevin had said, um, it's really challenging when you can't bring them to Trinity because for everyone – who step foot on our campus. I think they understand the sense of community and how special Trinity is. Um, but what we've tried to do is bring Trinity through the screen virtually to them in different capacities. And that's extended to FaceTime tours. It has been a lot of different Zoom calls. And I think uh, through it all, what we've realized is the relationships, which is kind of that, um, kind of the meat of the recruiting, that stays the same. And developing those relationships and cultivating those relationships while it's different than being face to face, that is still uh, at the heart of what we're doing. And I think getting to know um, our recruits, we've actually had more time to get to know them uh, at a deeper level than perhaps we have in the past because we are uh, perhaps even more careful than we've been in terms of making sure that we know exactly who we're bringing in into our team culture and into our program. Um, I think our current players and our alums, we're really, really fortunate to have some incredible alums who have been willing to engage in that process as well um, and, and get on Zoom calls, get on phone calls. And I think uh, as much as um, we are evaluating and recruiting players into our team and our culture, so are our players, our current players. They want to bring in individuals who will elevate and contribute positively to what we're working to build. Um, and so I think it, it has been very different. I think from the virtual standpoint, it, you know, as, as Kevin said, we can get really creative with Zoom and we cr can create some very interesting spaces for dialogue. Um, you know, I think too that the other thing we've been working on is continuing to maintain those relationships with coaches, um, AAU coaches, high school coaches, and, and calling uh, coaches who also coach against the people we're recruiting and hearing from those standpoints and those perspectives. So I think in some ways, it's helped in, in the depth of getting to know the players and the families. I think in, in some ways it's been definitely challenging. We want to share all that Trinity has to offer. And so much of that is about being on campus, but in terms of, of the relationships, which in my opinion kind of is what that recruiting piece is in, in some ways it's really strengthened that. Thanks Emily, staying with you. Uh, you've got uh, six new members to your team coming in this year or, or have already already here ready to start practice in just under two weeks. Um, slightly larger than you would normally have with a basketball team. So talk a little bit about your, your, your process or your thought process in both building depth in a program and to what extent do you head into each year with kind of knowing you need to fill specific needs as well as trying to find the best available player. So what, what's that process look like for you at the start of your cycle? Sure, absolutely. I think each year we evaluate what some weaknesses are uh, from the prior season or things that we felt like we were maybe missing to take it to the next level. Um, so for anyone who watched this last year, I think you can uh, see that three point shooting wasn't our specialty last year. And so we brought in five of our six that are very capable from three. Um, so addressing those weaknesses is, is definitely at the forefront. I think depth for us is so important because we want to create a competitive environment in practice. And we want to create situations and scenarios where we're competing at an extremely high level in a practice scenario so that we are prepared for those game scenarios. And I think depth only allows and enables our ability to do that. Um, I think you're obviously working for, through injuries at times too. And so that depth can kind of uh, mitigate 
the impact that those injuries have. Um, and then lastly, it helps us play a certain way. I think we want to be a team that uh, when we have a style of play that's very fast and up-tempo, and that does uh, often lead to a lot of subbing during games, but we also want the ability to mix up playing a little bit smaller with playing a little bit bigger, depending on, on who we're playing and what we're trying to take advantage of. Um, and depth certainly adds to that. Um, and, and hopefully it's something that we would like to continue is just having a deeper squad to, to continue to reach new levels of competitiveness. Great, thanks, Emily. Um, Kevin, uh, you know, most people who know the sport of rowing a little bit know that uh, uh, particularly at the time when we were both in college, rowing was, uh, there was a lot of a walk-on culture. It's maybe gone away. There are a lot more uh, youth clubs now, but um, still a sport where you can get a lot of walk-ons and maybe even some people who haven't um, been rowers before, but have been athletes in another sport. So um, what does a typical class look like for you? And, and what's that, that split like between experienced rowers and just athletes who want to try a new sport? Yeah. Um, the walk-on uh, culture and the walk-on opportunity is still really important for us. Um, the numbers have dwindled, and I think that's twofold. One, rowing on the junior level, the scholastic level, has exploded. So there are just tens of thousands of kids now who are rowing. Um, so the recruiting pool is much uh, deeper and more broad. We do still want to offer the opportunity because rowing is a sport that you can learn the basics fairly quickly. It's a training-based sport where success is really built upon your innate athleticism and then your work ethic and your ability to train over time. Um, so we have a boy, you know, right now who is a three-year varsity rower, Peter Thiel, walked onto the team. So we want to continue, and he's a fantastic, fantastic oarsman. We want to continue to offer that opportunity. In a typical recruiting class, um, this year's as an example, we have 12 recruited oarsmen who from kind of start to finish, they were interested in Trinity. We were really interested in them. We have two boys who were not necessarily a part of the recruiting pool, but were rowers in high school. And they're very welcome to have an opportunity to participate with the team. And then we have four walk on guys who haven't done the sport, but are athletic, have committed to the uh, team standards and will, uh, I think, be really great additions to the squad. Um, so and I think that's a fairly typical breakdown where a, a large chunk of recruited athletes, a couple who have experience and then a few who do not. And we're very eager to work with them all. Thanks. And, and Matt, maybe at the other end of the spectrum, your sport, oftentimes uh, young men will go and play a year or multiple years of junior hockey. So you're getting uh, young men who matriculate at Trinity at 19, 20, 21 years old. They've been out of high school for a couple of years. Um, does, that, does it change your pitch between those, the straight out of high school, straight out of prep school player and someone who's been playing junior hockey? And how do you kind of navigate, uh, navigate that, that line on when players should, what, what's best for their uh, development as a young man, as a hockey player to, to come to college? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think hockey, well, I know hockey is unique and that you can continue to push back college in, until you're 20, 21 because of this thing called junior hockey. Um, the fact of the matter is, is if you look at the national champions from the last seven or eight years, 10 years, it's, it's generally one of the older teams in the country. Uh, it's not something I'm proud of. It's not something I like, but I do like winning. And uh, as a result, um, we do recruit quite a few a few guys from uh, junior hockey. Now, it gets a little taboo reputation, but those players we get from junior hockey, they had a great high school resume, great high school transcript. They're wonderful people. And oftentimes at 21, you're a lot more mature than at 18. And, and we get a, a little more refined person and player at the age of 21. We also have four kids on our active roster right now who came straight from prep school. Um, they were ready to come to prep school. I mean, they were ready to come from college uh, straight from prep school. And, and if they went to junior, we might have missed them to division one. Now, part, part of the issue is we're always going after who we find to be division one hockey players. And those division one hockey players want to play a certain number of years to give that an opportunity um, to see if uh, an Ivy League school will come after them. Um, so it, it's kind of mutual. Yes, we do go after older people, but we get tired of hearing no from 18 and 19 year olds a lot. Um, 
so that's kind of been the trend as to why we've we've uh, gone after the older player. But you still can find that kind of gem in the prep school circuit uh, who who's ready to uh, ready to go to college and and ready to be elite. Great. Um, well, taking something you said right there, Matt, the the something that a lot of our coaches run into, which is a family that might be holding out for a Division One opportunity versus. Uh, what we really feel is an exceptional experience, uh, the D3 NESCAC model of uh, a little bit of balance in the life, but still being able to compete uh, at a very high level and uh, get a great education. So uh, I'll start with you, Emily. How do you, and this is a question we got from the audience, how do you kind of promote what we do here at Trinity in the NESCAC in Division Three, particularly when it's up against families who have always had it in their eyes if their son or daughter was going to go to a uh, to play Division One sports. Sure, absolutely. I think from a from a competitive standpoint, um, we are targeting those student athletes who either have those opportunities or um, who have maybe had that as a goal. And I think there are a lot of misconceptions at the Division Three level of what that looks like. I think at the NESCAC, when you're competing at the best of the best. We do have players from every single level. We absolutely have players in this conference who have Division I offers. And I think what's important is really laying out what that experience looks like, because there are so many opportunities that are going to be available in the NESCAC. Um, one, you're competing on a national scale. So you're competing for a national championship, whereas most uh, Division I students, athletes, should they go that route, aren't getting to compete on that national scale. But more importantly are the academic um, and the co-curricular opportunities that they have. Um, and very rarely do they have the opportunity to go to an institution like Trinity that has such a developed alumni base. Um, so you're talking career connections, internship opportunities, and those opportunities that they can actually take advantage of because they have the flexibility and time. Um, and two, the opportunities such as study abroad and being an engaged member of a really awesome and incredible campus community. And I think when, when you're able to talk about um, the, the depth of the experience that they will have at Trinity and then being able to, you know, and as Matt said earlier, uh, missing bringing them on campus because having them set foot on campus, I think it really does shine. It's such a vibrant atmosphere and it's such a place where um, you can see how incredible the Trinity community is in terms of wanting to make a difference in the world. Uh, I think that is, is what we really try to sell is um, obviously, we talk about the athletic piece and, and competing on that national scale and wanting to get to a national championship, but more importantly is uh, the decision that will be a 40-year decision in terms of really impacting their careers. And, uh, and, and Emily, you've actually had some, you have some transfers in this year who coming from Division I experiences and maybe seeing a little bit of the light. Uh, what about you, Kevin, uh, in your sport when you're probably – maybe even more so than, uh, than Matt and Emily, you've got a finite number of rowing schools. And so therefore you, you butt heads with a lot of the Ivies quite frequently. Sure. Yeah. All the time. Um, yeah. We talk about what, what do you want your college experience to be? Um, and Emily, I echo her, her the, the challenge that we face. We want them to come on campus and to see what the experience of a student athlete is actually like. Um, earlier in this webinar, I mentioned academics have to come first the unique offering that Trinity has with a small college, urban setting, outstanding faculty, outstanding alumni resources, that's number one. The athletic programs and the offerings that we give, but then the opportunity to really engage in something else substantive. Um, we have guys on the team who are in acapella troops, who are the editors for the Trinity Tripod, um, who do, are engineering majors and have extensive uh, uh, commitments on top of their academic programs. So they're doing other things. We want them to see that and to see the totality of their experience as a college athlete, because we really want to honor the division three model, the division, uh, the NESCAC ideal and the Trinity ideal of what, you know, practicing what we preach, where it is the, the well-rounded experience with academic and athletic excellence. Then they go to a D1 place and see in their official visit or unofficial visit what that experience offers. I think it's going to differ quite a bit. So we want students to pick Trinity to come on campus and to see what our student athletes are doing. And I, I think it's outstanding if it matches with the aspirations and um, kind of the expectations of those student athletes, then we have a great match and a, and a great experience for both parties, the team and the student athlete. 
And Matt, what about you? Your program, like Emily's, uh, you, you've had a number of uh, really successful transfers from from the D1 experience and some great D1 programs. So, in the on the front end, how do you kind of navigate that with students? Yeah, I mean, you win Division Three national championships with Division One level players, and it comes down to the things that Emily and, and Kevin mentioned in selling um, the Trinity experience, the network, the internship opportunities. Um, to, to those uh, young men or women um, and, and to put them over the top. Now, each of them, it, it, there's a lot of pressure from them. All they've heard their whole life is division one, division one, division one. And what keeps you up at night as a recruiter is finding ways to get that more or less out of their head and sell an entire Trinity experience to them. And everybody in our locker room finally came to what I like to think a mature realization of, wow, this place does provide you know, division one level ice hockey. Um, but in, in 20 years, uh, I, I really set myself up for something special because of the decision I made when I was 18, 19, 20 years old. So that's what we're trying to, to get across to, to the players that we're recruiting is, is that high level, best, best opportunity you can find at the division three level in the country um, and an opportunity to win, for champ, win championships. And, and yeah, we, we've been able to beat out some division ones with that approach. A uh, question from the audience and, and it's relating to prep schools. Uh, so many prep schools have bubbled this year. And so they're doing uh, intramurals uh, within their campuses, but they're not, uh, at least for this fall semester, going outside of their own campuses. Um, and many of those students also missed out on summer play. So uh, specifically with those residential prep schools, um, how, how challenging is it to, uh, to recruit students from those settings right now? And how do you find ways to stay connected with uh, students who certainly on the face of it from their prep school experience often are academically qualified uh, to be at Trinity? Uh, Kevin? I, we, well, in rowing, I have a, a big advantage in that there are objective metrics that we use to evaluate student athletes that I think are still in the individual's control we understand that it may be difficult to train, it may be difficult to access a, a single skull or a ergometer or a weight room, but there are still a lot of ways that an individual can demonstrate their commitment to training, their commitment to fitness, their uh, also just their potential, their, their work capacity in, in many different ways. So a lot of our kids come from prep schools and many of the athletes that we're most interested in have made those steps to really um, individually in most cases better themselves and continue their athletic progress with the caveat that we understand it's not easy and it's been you know very very tough to access resources um, to try and to try and get better but you know you need a pair of running shoes to get in a good workout so um, you know on, on the intramural stuff we we hope that they're in practice footage um, and I don't know if this applies to the basketball and, and hockey teams but many prep schools they're just dumping a ton of practice footage of kids so that coaches can see them move and see them you know how their biomechanics look and how they move in a boat um, so I think the prep schools are also adapting to help offer more information, even though it's not the typical information you, you get. And that's helpful. Emily, I, I, uh, I'll ask you the same question, but it's obviously a, a little bit different in basketball, maybe some more intangibles and uh, probably harder to get a sense of someone's uh, you know, competitive drive when they're playing against their teammates on video every day. So uh, same question for you. Sure, absolutely. I think we, you know, we are evaluating based on old film for the most part. Um, I think it's something that we recruit anyway, not just based on ability, but on capability. So we are looking for uh, not just where they're at right now, but where we think they can be over the scope of the next three, four or five years. Um, it is challenging. I, I would echo what Kevin said. I think uh, schools are getting really creative in what they do in terms of, of filming practices, in terms of being able to send out uh, workouts and, and that kind of thing. But uh, we are definitely evaluating on a different scale than we have before. I think it obviously starts with evaluating the person first. And we want individuals that are engaged in their local community. Um, and through this process, we're asking questions to evaluate um, their character and what they would be bringing to campus. 
um, and how they would then use that to help further our, our team culture. Um, and I think, again, what we're looking to do is address some of the weaknesses that we've had uh, in the past a, as a team in terms of, of some rebounding deficiencies and that kind of thing and trying to translate that into what we're looking for in this year. Um, and some of those skills are translated a little bit easier in practice settings um, and others aren't. But I think uh, for our end, we're continuing to develop those relationships with coaches, um, reach out to different people who, who may have seen them play in the past live. As you said, normally on a given year, we're evaluating what they look like when they come out of a game. Um, are they giving high fives to their teammates? What's their bench demeanor look like? Um, and even on live stream, some of those things are really, really hard to see and evaluate. Um, so we're trying to ask questions that lead us to, to kind of see what they look like in, in those situations. Um, but it is certainly a challenge. I think uh, schools have done a great job getting creative in what they send, and we're going to continue to do our due diligence to recruit the best student athletes we feel like will add to our team culture. And this one's for Matt and Emily. Um, Multi-sport athletes. We're going to give Kevin a pass on this one because it's really hard for, for rowers to, to commit year-round and, and have multi-sport athletes. I'm sure there are a few. Uh, but Matt and Emily, uh, obviously, we still have some multi-sport athletes at Trinity, maybe not as many as we had 10, 15, and certainly 20 years ago. Um, but talk about each of your attitudes as coach. Matt, you first, you, you coach two different sports. You're a multi-sport sport coach, but talk about that, the multi-sport athlete and uh, some success you've had with them over the past few years. Yeah, I mean, it, it's harder. It's, uh, there are fewer and fewer in this world with a, in this day and age of specialization at an early age. You just don't find as many who take uh, more than one sport very seriously. Um, we, we have a few, um, you know, uh, hockey and golf. I have a hockey and golfer. I was fortunate enough to play hockey and golf um, when I was here, but it, everything has ratcheted up a great deal. And I hope, please don't, I hope you don't take this the wrong way. But when I was at Trinity in around 2000, I, I played number one on the golf team and I was first line on the hockey team. I probably wouldn't have made the lineup on the golf team a couple uh, last year. And I sure wouldn't be in the hockey lineup. Everything has just gotten a lot better and a lot more competitive. So it's harder to find that multiple sport athlete. I encourage it. I'd love it if we had more. It's just the nature of specialization these days. It's, it's really hard to find it. And Emily, you had, uh, you, you had a student athlete who graduated last year, Peace Gabari, who was an All-American in track and a uh, NESCAC Defensive Player of the Year. So, so same question to you. Absolutely. Um, I think we've been really fortunate to have some tremendous multi-sport athletes come through here. Obviously, you mentioned Peace, Devin Walsh, also uh, an incredible thrower. Um, we've had in the past Courtney Erickson, who uh, was incredible both on the softball field and on the court for us, and Sheena Landy, who you know was a two-time captain in both basketball and soccer. So we've had some some incredible athletes come through, and I think. Um, you know, it's not for everybody. I think it takes an incredible balance and dedication. I think it's about being uh, with the team that you are in season with and being fully committed. Um, I think it, it takes an incredible level of time management, but I, I also think it's absolutely doable. Um, I think it, it is something that, uh, you know, as Matt said, a lot of athletes have been specializing and, and focusing on individual sports or, or whatever their primary sport is. Um, but I think that's also one of the things that makes uh, the NESCAC awesome is that you can play multiple sports. Um, in some ways, it's been a huge sell to get those student athletes who maybe could compete at the Division II or Division I uh, level to be able to come to Trinity and participate in multiple sports at an incredibly high level. Um, so I think it can absolutely be a benefit. I think it takes a special student athlete to be able to manage it, but I, I certainly think it's doable. And from our team, we embrace anybody who, who can do that. Evan, what about you? It's a huge advantage, uh, Emily, a hundred percent. I agree. We, I think have won, uh, maybe one is not the right word to use, but have attracted really great student athletes because we give them that opportunity. Uh, currently right now we have a very, very talented rower and swimmer. He is, I think he was, he chose Trinity because Carlos Vega, the swimming coach and I said, if you want to do this, you're talented enough. You seem to have the direction and the uh, self-motivation and the organization to do it. Of course, we're going to embrace you uh, and your pursuit to doing this. John Graves, uh, class of 2010, won the McCook Award. 
He was the captain and I think one of the best defenders on the men's soccer team. And he was one of the top oarsmen ever to come through the program. Um, and I, John chose Trinity because Mike Pilger and, uh, and I said, you can do both, of course. Like we would love to offer you that opportunity. So it also kind of harkens back to the question earlier about the division three um, philosophy and really honoring what we, uh, you know, what we believe in and, and showing it in our recruitment and then in enabling student athletes to, to do multiple sports if they're so inclined. Uh, switching gears a, a, just a little bit, um, how, how do we, you know, how do we plan to retain student athletes uh, and different student athletes? So, for example, not only recruiting student athletes of color in, in the current climate, but also retaining them. Um, you know, we've had a lot of conversations within our department about this, but I'll start with you, Emily. Like, talk about how some of those conversations maybe have changed over the past few months and also um, how specific you have to be in order to, to have stated goals in that area. Sure, absolutely. I think basketball is, is a diverse sport in nature. Um, and I think it is something that we really believe in and think is important is to have an environment that promotes inclusion and diversity. Um, I think from our end, um, conversations about social justice, we talk about current events anyway on our team. And it's something that, that we try to broaden and enhance their experience, not just on the basketball court, but in who they are as people. And I think our job as coaches is to challenge them, um, again, not just from an athletic standpoint, but to uh, challenge them in their scope of thinking and, and the way they approach things. And I think diversity helps create um, those dialogues. I think it helps uh, kind of create uh, well-rounded individuals who believe in looking at different viewpoints. Um, and it's something that has been incredibly important to our team. And I think it's also something that our, our student athletes view as, as using their platform as student athletes to have a voice in creating positive change, both within the department and in the overall uh, campus community. Thanks. Um, so each of you has been at Trinity for, uh, you know, a number of years now. And what have, what have you seen maybe in the, in the way in which the, the athletes you're recruiting, the athletes who are most attracted to Trinity and, and how that's changed? Um, Kevin, I'm going to give you the benefit of going first here just because you've got the, the longest head coaching tenure. So what do you think has changed the most in, you know, the, the, the athlete who's in your sweet spot? Yeah, um, we, I, th I think over the last 10 to 15 years, um, the pool is just so much larger. It is um, really on the junior level because of the growth in division one women's rowing has supported enormous growth in the recruiting pools um, of potential rowers. So the number of people that we can reach out to, the geographic representation, um, you know, they're rowing for its entirety as a sport has really struggled to expand opportunities for um, participation amongst all sorts of different uh, demographics. And I think we're able to connect with and reach more people all around the world, all around the country, because there are more people exposed to the sport on the junior level. Um, and the previous two assistant, assistant coaches, excuse me, and the current assistant coach have done yeoman's work in getting Trinity out in the rowing community, that we are a outstanding liberal arts college with an outstanding rowing program in an urban setting that really embraces all of the uh, all of the items that go along with that um, and are interested in community engagement and transformation of the spaces that we occupy. So when you can reach a larger pool with that message, I think we can be more effective recruiters for the institution and for our program specifically. And, and Matt, what about you? Same question with a little different tint. Um, you've, uh, through a lot of hard work, had the benefit of a national championship in hockey, a top 10 finish nationally in, in golf. So uh, success certainly changes the pool a little bit, but how have you seen that, uh, that pool and that, that trendy athlete change a little bit? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a tough one for me to answer because from the second I showed up on campus, I wanted those qualities that I mentioned earlier in terms of that, that determination, um, that 
complete uh, that commitment to complete excellence in your life. That's that's been a, a catchphrase since since I've gotten on campus. But yeah, with, with success, we're able to get a little more traction um, with that higher end athlete. You know, it's our goal to be the premier hockey program in the NESCAC. And when somebody says, "Oh, I'm not going to get a Division One offer," offer I want Trinity to be to be the first words out of their mouth. And 2013, that was a little bit of lip service. But right now, uh, we're we're zeroing in on the point where oh, uh, Harvard's not going to work out. Let me look at Trinity. Um, and so that's, those are the students that we're able to get a little more traction with and, and beat out uh, some, of the, some of the schools that we used to lose more battles than win. Um, we're, we're, we're having a little better luck these days because of that, that, uh, that body of work and, and, and the messaging. Well, one of the things that's been taking place across the country is, uh, particularly at the Division I level, but we've seen it quite a bit at the Division Three level as well, are the number of uh, sport programs that are getting cut in athletic departments. You're seeing athletic departments scale back from uh, mid thirties to, you know, dropping eight, nine, 10 teams, uh, Stanford, Brown, Dartmouth, all with massive uh, sports uh, cut, William & Mary, my alma mater as well. So um, is that, does that ever come up with recruits in your conversations? Are, are high school student athletes attuned to those things? Are they, are they watching those closely or uh, is it, is it not really been a point of conversation in recruiting uh, to this point? Kevin? Um, th there has been, and there have been some high profile rowing programs that have been cut. Um, the UConn women's program, Dartmouth lightweight men's, GW men, the George Washington men. Um, coincidentally, we have recruiting crossover with GW and with Dartmouth. Um, the Stanford men, Stanford lightweight. So it's, it's hit our sport. Um, I don't know if it's disproportionately uh, heavy, but it's, it's been a heavy impact on us. Um, st student athletes, you know, it's their parents really who ask about it. I think it's much more on their radar than on the um, student athletes, although recruits will have former teammates who are at those institutions. So, so it is somewhat, I think, on their mind. Um, you know, we have uh, extraordinary support from our alumni, um, both in annual giving and in endowed funds. Um, and so, you know, we work very hard to support the 43 uh, rowers who are currently on our roster, um, you know, to give them every opportunity. And I, I thank the administration for your efforts, you know, I, so I, I don't know necessarily that it's on um, a, a, it's a huge part of their decision or the discussion right now, but it has been a conversation with parents. What we assure them is that, you know, we will do everything we can to continue uh, in perpetuity to offer the best experience possible and, and feel confident saying that. Yeah. And, and uh, for, our, for our listeners out there and, and viewers, we, you know, we, we went through some hard conversations as a department earlier this summer and, and much like every part of the college had uh, uh, cutbacks as a, as a result of the, uh, you know, the, the reduced revenue we had last spring. Uh, all of our students went home and uh, it was a challenging time for a number of colleges and universities. And uh, one of the guiding principles that we had in making those decisions was to continue to support uh, the 30 varsity sorts that we, we had and the experiences of those student athletes. And um, far be it for me to presume what how other institutions made those decisions, but um, there was, uh, you know, these things don't uh, often happen, happen in a vacuum. And it really seemed like there were several um, schools that fell in line quickly after Brown and Stanford in the, in the span of three or four days in the summer uh, made their announcements very quickly. Um, you know, another, a number of other schools uh, made announcements and, uh, and are, you know, suffering through the, the challenges of, of what that means to a program. So uh, a question I often get from, uh, from alums and particularly alums with, with students coming up is whether or not you take the truest of true walk-ons. Somebody you, you probably haven't even seen them uh, in high school. They weren't on your radar at all, but they show up on campus as a freshman and they walk uh, into one of your offices or shoot you an email and say, coach, do you have walk-on tryouts? So uh, do each of you have walk-on tryouts still? And, and just broadly, how do you, how do you kind of deal with that process? Because as we've now talked about for 50 minutes, it's recruiting is highly specialized. Recruiting is highly competitive now. And so uh, Emily, starting with you, how, how do you deal with those situations when you have someone who's a, uh, they're admitted already, they're here and they want to try out for the women's basketball team. 
Sure, absolutely. I think we, we absolutely want to give them space to um, try out for the team. I think uh, as diligently as our, our staff works in recruiting, uh, there are always people you're going to miss. And I think if someone has chosen Trinity on their own, um, they clearly understand what it is as an institution and what it represents. I think um, there are some challenges that go with starting a little bit later. So obviously this year we start October 15th. Normally we start November 1st. Um, there's a lot of uh, voluntary preseason conditioning and, and things that our, our student athletes are doing. Um, so so it, it can be a bit a bit challenging uh, to, to fully get engaged, although they have those opportunities to do so. Um, but they absolutely do have the ability to try out. Um, we have had a, a number in the past who have tried out, and we have had a few that have, have made our team in, in different capacities. Um, and I think that is something that we view that process uh, as part of the recruiting process. Um, if they are here and they want to go through the process of trying out, we absolutely want to give them that opportunity. Uh, it's a challenge, especially as you talked about our depth earlier with, with the numbers we have. There do become some some challenges just in terms of how uh, much playing time we have available and that kind of thing. But obviously, we're always looking for people who will add value to our culture uh, and add value to our competitiveness. So if they bring both of those things, it's definitely something we're, we're willing to talk about. Matt, what about you? You've got an easy answer and a hard answer. Golf is a pretty, uh, it's pretty cut and dry. You, you shoot a score and you're, you're good enough to be on the team, but uh, hockey is a collision sport uh, with a lot more nuances. Yeah, I'll start with my golf hat here. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, four walk-ons on the team right now. One story I, I love to share is, is we had a boy who graduated two years ago uh, and he didn't play a competitive round of golf until he was almost 18 years old and uh, just had a found this incredible passion uh, for golf. And by his senior year at Trinity, he was playing number three and he was a number three on the best golf team to ever play at Trinity. He finished number 10 in the entire country uh, in the NCAA championships in Lexington, Kentucky. He's now playing on the mini tours in Florida. So recruiting for college golf is a very inexact science. And so as a result, it tends to, we tend to have a lot of wiggle room when it comes to, to the golfers. Uh, so uh, we have that open tryout every year. And, and obviously it's, it's uh, benefited us to keep a slightly larger roster just for the opportunity for a walk on who might develop late. Uh, hockey's, hockey. hockey's a different, it's hard. I mean, uh, our coaching staff, uh, our assistant coach, uh, coach Battlementi goes all over the, all over the country, all over North America, Let's say we look at 500 forwards. Of those 500 forwards, let's say 150 of them can get into Trinity and would be interested. Of those 150, we need four. So we have scoped, we have combed uh, North America high and low to find those four best people. Um, and chances are pretty good uh, that those four are gonna be better than anybody who comes from the population at large. That said, you are more than welcome to try out. Uh, in my nine years, we have kept four walk-ons. Um, and so it can be done. It is very hard to do, but it can be done. Kevin, what about you? I, uh, we typically have a 5.45 a.m. or 6 a.m. arrival at the boathouse. So if a student is on the Trinity campus and wants to arrive at the boathouse at 5.45 a.m. to get on an erg, to get on the water, to participate with excellence, they are very welcome to do so. Um, and you know, that 5.45 a.m. weeds out a lot of people, but if they have the work ethic, if they have the commitment, if they have the accountability, there, there will always be an opportunity for them to participate. Um, doesn't guarantee them a seat, it doesn't guarantee them time on the water, but if they show up and adhere to the team standards, we'd you know, still love to work with walk-ons. Coach McDermott, just give me a great idea for our next staff meeting. I think we'll start at five. <laughs> to really see who wants to be there that day. Well, as we wrap up, I'm going to ask each of you uh, coaches to um, just talk a little bit optimistically about what you're most looking forward to uh, for the winter. And uh, just to, to reframe the conversation for our viewers, uh, the plan right now is for us to, uh, to play competitively this winter. Um, and uh, we will send all of our students home at Thanksgiving, uh, athletes and non-athletes. Uh, we do plan to bring our, our varsity athletes back in uh, early January, late December, early January, as we normally would, and play competitive seasons that end with NCAA championships in the winter seasons that are roughly at the same time as they've always been. 
there will be some modifications to the uh, NCAA championship field sizes, but uh, they're still planning on championships. Um, and as for spring sports, we, we do not believe there'll be virtually any modification to the schedules for spring sports. We do plan to play uh, fall sports competitively in the springtime, and more likely than not, those will be roughly half seasons that almost exclusively focus on NESCAC play, uh, presuming that other NESCAC schools uh, uh, come along on the, in the same way and, and still want to compete. So we, we do have a lot to look forward to. Um, we've had a, a very good uh, last 10 days or so on campus in terms of the uh, number of cases or the lack thereof on campus. And so we are able to uh, move forward in a what we call a green alert level on campus, which gives us more flexibility to have more athletic activity. So for each of you, we're going to start with Emily. Um, just something you're looking forward to as we proceed. And uh, Emily, 13 days away from your first practice. Yeah, I think we can't wait to be together as a team. Um, due to number restrictions and, and due to some of the policies on, on campus right now, uh, we haven't been able to be together as our full team family. And I think that's something we're really looking forward to. Um, our first years are really excited to really get to integrate into um, our team environment and really get to a place where we're moving towards competition. Uh, I think for us, obviously, we, we all feel like we've waited a long time to get to this place. And uh, we're just excited to have that opportunity and get to be back together again and, and work towards competition later this winter. Matt, what about you? You've got your golfers right now out at uh, Tumblebrook in West Hartford. Uh, and then same as Emily, uh, men's hockey hitting the ice in 13 days. Yeah, I mean, as our golf team's having a blast right now. We're just enjoying being around each other, enjoying trying to get better without the real high stakes of, of, a, of qualifying or matches that weekend. Um, on the hockey front, I mean, I, why do we get in this business? We get in this business because we love the people we're around. We love what we do. And I, I miss my guys, you know, I, I just I want to be around them. Uh, I want to develop with them. And, uh, and lastly, I, I think we're going to be pretty good this year. So I'm hopeful we can, we can get it going and, and, and we can execute on, on what I just said. And Kevin, uh, the falls looked a little different, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of single skulls and then hopefully moving towards uh, groups and boats again. So what, what else are you looking forward to? Uh, it, it's, it's been amazing to be back on the water, outdoors, exercising, you know, working together to, to excel. Um, we have today, we've already had this morning, 18 guys on the water. We have another 16 this afternoon. Um, yeah, it's, it's a big team. It's a motivated group. 2019, the varsity was back in the top six at our national championship. They were second in the NESCAC. Last spring, charging with a head full of steam, Things got derailed, of course, but uh, we have a group now, 43 deep, that's ready to light their hair on fire and go after it again. And, you know, just, yeah, it's, I, I can't wait. Like, you, you know, today in singles, it's a great day to be on the water. In May, when we get to the championships, we're going to be, we're going to be coming. Sam, we're, and we're very excited to see our teams competing once again and, and very soon. I want to thank all three of you for, uh, for being with us today and, uh, thank everyone for watching. Uh, and finally, uh, just uh, you know, as today was a great example of the type of coaches who we have scouring the country to bring uh, a diverse and talented student athlete group to Trinity every single year uh, and students who were proud of not only on the field, on the water, uh, on the ice, but also in the classroom and in our community. Um, and and we've, we've had a lot of really hard conversations uh, among our staff about how ways we can continue to keep our focus on bringing diverse classes uh, to campus and also creating an athletic department and a campus uh, that can not only welcome the uh, diverse population, but also sustain them and retain them uh, here on campus for great experiences. So uh, thank you all for uh, watching and uh, go Bantams.